Hey everyone, welcome to Jeff Bruno's live. Good to see everyone, even though I don't see you. Good to see you uh, live, and um, hopefully um, uh, this will. Sorry, I'm just making sure Facebook's tracking right here. All right, looks like it is. Looks like we're good. Sorry, um, always delays on these lives. Uh, so. Good to see everyone. This will uh, be my um, last live at home. Uh, in my home, I will be at um, down the Jersey Shore. Actually, since we are a basically 100% virtual organization, I will be down in the Jersey Shore um, for the summer, starting this weekend. Ooh. So, looking forward to that. Um, thank God, summer's here. Um, so, updates generally. Hope everybody's doing well on this. Uh, Thursday, June 17th, and um, any financial updates? Uh, no, I mean, just uh, generally, you know, when, you, when you're thinking about your business planning, make sure you have, you know, the ability to uh, have elasticity in some of your models. Uh, this is sort of my one quick piece of advice, meaning elasticity in your pricing, elasticity in, the, in being able to lower your costs as you increase volumes. Um, or maybe some fixed costs that can be adjusted as you as you grow, maybe with improved equipment, technology, things of that nature. And the reason I bring that up is, you know, we're we're seeing an environment shifting from a uh, um, a very liquid, liquid um, very low priced, low interest rate scenario to a tightening of liquidity. Both with the, the banks that started that uh, they started la late last year, fall of last year tightening liquidity uh, among giving out loans to borrowers, which is going to start to tighten up general liquidity once the government stops printing printing so much money and handing money out to people. Uh, liquidity will, will begin to tighten up even more. And uh, you're seeing it in inflation. You're seeing it in prices going up. And, um, you know, commodities going up in price affecting consumers. Um, so your buying power is going down. So make sure you can adjust prices. Make sure you can cut costs as you as you develop you grow your business or you will see a squeeze and us small business owners if we see squeezes it's material sometimes business ending in these kind of environments so even though things are good be very careful with that with your 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 purchasing power and your ability to um, adjust so let's dive right into questions um, first question is from Marielle Goodrich. I'm going to shorten this a little bit because uh, it's very long, but Marielle is, says, how do I know if I'm charging appropriately for a new concept? Um, Isle Bartend is a concierge mixology service for private and public events. We specialize in organic, fresh fruit, and herb cocktails and mocktails. We are a full-service caterer for the bar side of events. Um, so what she's essentially then saying here is, that she, uh, she does a lot of high touch, uh, really, really nice stuff, great cocktails, laser engraved things um, for her clients, and that she has is only making profit on the service side of the scenario, um, only on the, um, uh, not on the liquor or the, uh, the pieces that she uses to to do the product. So um, this is a, a great, um, great idea. I looked at your website, Muriel, and I love it. I love where your area is, you being in um, Naples. That speaks probably very well to the type of clientele you're trying to attract, with this, which is obviously private parties. You can't go into a, you know, a, a, a bar or a business, of course. So uh, I love the idea. You're in good weather, so you have a lot of options there. Um, so how do you know if you're charging properly? Well, that that's a hard, hard thing to know. I have no idea about your finances, so I'd have to see what you're trying to do here. But when I say charge, when you say charge properly, you have to know first off what your market will be willing to absorb. That is the affluent market. They tend to be buffeted a little bit and take on more um, absorption of things. Um, but you know, don't sell yourself short. Don't undercut just to, 
get clients, you're probably going to have to go towards again, sorry to mention this again, but towards the more super affluent with your product and keep your pricing high to make money. Um, you probably want to get really good servers and, um, and have that be also a, uh, a big piece of your, of your offering. Um, so, you know, I, you want to look at what is your profit from the prep and service time? What is that gross profit from that? 20%, 30%, 50%. What is it in combination with your product cost? that you're not making any money on, that you're passing through to the client. Um, and is that something that you can map out? Um, because you're gonna need a pretty substantial profit there because you're making nothing on the product um, to be able to have enough cash flow. So I'd wanna also know what is your cash flow component? How much of your bill, like if you charge somebody five grand for a night, what is your product cost in that because that's a cash heavy scenario you have to buy the product ahead you have to put the money out you know maybe you have to store some products so you have some inventory considerations there that's heavy to store that cost wise um, and then you have to um, you know only get the profit once the event's done um, on the server side you have to pay out the servers pretty quickly um, and the prep aggress you know so you got to make sure that cash flow cycle is is uh is not hurting you as you build. And I wouldn't be against you throwing a small markup on the product if possible, you know, five, 10, 15%. Um, people, people understand that there's handling of the product um, that, you know, you can charge for. Um, so look at those costs. Um, love, first of all, love the concept, beautiful website. Uh, look at those costs, see what they are. Make sure you're ahead Maybe ask for deposits um, from the people, which you might already be doing, to cover the alcohol. Maybe you need a fifth, whatever your percentage is, you need a 50, 60% deposit to cover the alcohol so you don't have cash out before you get to the event. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. I would say um, welcome, to the, welcome to the group and uh, you got the right area. So, oh, one last piece influencers i would see if you can get some local influencers that make sense for you to start uh you know pushing your your service and your product and saying oh i've had the best experience with with this it was awesome it's well worth the money so and so forth it's amazing how fast i can go in uh, in that kind of community so uh good luck next question heather first off heather brockman first off heather i heard the news amazing so excited for you um so that is awesome and i've been pulling for you so secondly um heather this question is incredible so let's go through this um heather brockman her business is the uh, mobile pet salon um, and she says what are the steps you should take and terms you should put into legal paperwork when acquiring a, a company? So it looks like I will be acquiring a mobile grooming company that comes with three vans, three groomers, and a bather. I have never done this, and I'm not sure where to start as far as questions to ask, what details may need I may need from them, etc. So far, the only paperwork they have provided me are the P&L statements the last two years, the balance sheets, and I'm getting a price for the value of the vans. But since I can't buy a client list, I'm trying to make it fair on how to pay for the client she'll be bringing over. Okay, Heather, this is a lot of stuff. So now, here's the only good thing. This is small. So it's a small acquisition, three vans, three groomers, uh, and a bather. So, you know, I've seen uh, acquisitions all across the board. They tend to, you know, the small ones can tend to go quick. Um, you know, I, I saw a $2.5 million acquisition. Literally, the guy, the acquirer, sent a two-page term document. We call it LOI, letter of intent, to my client, who they were looking to acquire for $2.5 million. And that was it. No attorneys, no accountants, no due diligence. 
here it is, here's what you're gonna get for your $2.5 million value. And my client was okay with it. <laughs> so that went literally two page signed document. It took 30 days to close the deal. I've never seen that. That was the first time I've ever seen something like that. Normally deals in that range, 2 million, 5 million, 10 million, they take you know, four to six months, eight months to close. With all the back and forth, you throw the attorneys and the accountants in there and they mess up the process, especially the attorneys, they slow it down. So um, I would say uh, this could be a friendly scenario with you. I would just be careful not to overpay. So that's the tricky part. So if you're acquiring, I would send an LOI, a letter of intent to the person. It doesn't have to be too formal. A letter of intent to the person of what, assuming you've reviewed their financials. And by the way, send them to me, Heather. I'm happy to take a look at those. Really, Heather, send them to me. I'll take a look at those financials. It'll take me 15 minutes. I want to see if there's any red flags. Make sure you have balance sheet. You said you have P&L. Oh, no, you said you have balance sheet. Yeah, send that Send that over um, because you just want to look for things that might be out of line. And are you acquiring the business or the assets? Um, so that's also a question. If you're acquiring the business, you could get stuck with some of their potential liabilities. Um, you don't want that. So I would just acquire the assets, especially since you're acquiring the vans, the three groomers in the bay that are coming over, um, and their client list. That's assets. You don't need to acquire the company. Um, forget that. You don't want any of that liability. So that person will close down the company. You pull over those assets. You have a price for those assets. You pull them into your company, and you're done. So send her an LOI after reviewing it, what you think is a fair price after you appraise the vans and you know get a fair appraisal for those vans. Uh, that's the easy part. The vans will have a price. Um, and then it's really about what business she has created to date um, and how much money she's been successful with the current client base. So like if she has a, you know, I don't know, $100,000 EBITDA, uh, you know, maybe maybe you're paying her two fifty dollars to $300,000 to buy her out um, at two and a half to three times EBITDA number. I, I just, I'd like to know the specifics of what you're trying to do there. That could include the assets, the vans, and so on. Or you just pull it out and you say, I'm not even paying you EBITDA. You're too small. I'm going to pay you for the three vans. That's you know $80,000, $100,000 for the vans. That's their fair market value. And I'm going to pay you $50,000 for your client list or, I don't know, $100,000, whatever it is. Um, that's the safer way to probably do it. Um, and then you just take that over and keep moving. Um, so that's, that's awesome. That's the way to go. Organic and inorganic growth. It's a way to grow, scale a business. I love it, Heather. You are an absolute baller with this. And um, I think this is a very good way to move forward. So please um, let me take a look at that, okay? Um, second, and legal paperwork's easy, Heather. Don't even worry about it. Don't let the attorneys take you for 10 or 15 grand. I mean, this should be a couple grand, two, three, four grand maybe, quick, quick deal. It's an asset buy, it's clean. Title's transfer to you from the vans, that's it, it's done. Um, I wouldn't get too legalese on this, all right? Um, Next question, uh, Martina Wenk. Martina is asking how to get stronger in motivating myself. I run a home healthcare business in Switzerland. Oh, cool. I'm a nurse by trade. Doctors and hospitals refer patients to me and I bill the insurance company for services we provide. I sometimes feel I lose motivation and direction. How do I stay on track and keep motivated and moving forward? Thanks. Well, Martina, we always have those issues as entrepreneurs and self and business owners. Keeping motivated and staying motivated is certainly, you know, difficult. Um, and you can have a lot of ups and downs in, in doing this. Um, so 
home health care is awesome. It's exploding across the world, um, especially in the U.S. So I'm not sure how Switzerland is, but I'm sure Switzerland's seeing more of that as we age, uh, as our longevity increases and our average lifespan goes up 75, 80, 85. Soon, soon there, Martini, you might be uh, having a, a bunch of cent centaurians. I mean, with all this longevity research, we might be living to 130 here on the average soon. So you might have a heck of a business. <laughs> so, um, but Martina, I think um, the way to stay motivated is to, um, you know, figure out if what you're doing, figure out what you're, what you're trying to do to help people. Um, and stay excited about what you're doing. Um, I enjoy this, and that's why, I like on on these lives, I really enjoy giving people advice and helping small business owners. You know, from as small as a couple hundred thousand dollar business up to fifty million in some cases, um, helping them decide the direction for their business. Um, there's a lot of psychology in that, as much as some some CEOs don't want to admit. Um, the psychology is real important in your decision making. So you need to remain stable. Uh, you need good advisors around you. So if you're struggling, reach out to some people who might be mentors or advisors to keep you on the straight and narrow. <laughs> um, and just try to stay enjoying what you do. That's important. And if you don't like what you do or there are aspects of what you don't like, uh, of your business you don't like, then get rid of it. Outsource it. If you hate financials, outsource it to accounting and bookkeeping. If you hate, um, you know, invoicing in that same sense, outsource it. If you don't like HR stuff when you hire people, get somebody to help you with that. Um, stay in what the zone of what you like, um, and um, you know, it could be great. And also take breaks. You know, it's always good to take a break because um, you can get overwhelmed as a business owner. So that's, that's my advice. Next submitter is, um, is Scott Dunlap. Is it best that I continue working with a, his business, excuse me, Scott Dunlap, his business is human capital. Is it best that I continue working with a large brokerage or should I venture out and establish my own RIA, registered investment advisor? Fee-based can, can fee only, or should I look to join a team or partner with an independent advisors? Business description. I'm a financial planner, currently work with a large firm, produce insurance, assets under management, fee-based planning, but limited scope on both the insurance and the assets under management side. I'm becoming less interested in selling insurance, but it's a good revenue jar, so I need to increase my assets under management 10 to 15 times to make decent monthly recurring revenue torn on which direction I need to go. So, Scott, I used to be a financial advisor. I started my career as a financial advisor. I got out of it. I, I didn't like it. <laughs> but I started there. And um, it is a tough business. When I started, actually, uh, we were still calling. I mean, I was in Philadelphia, and I was still calling um, preferred security sales to Oklahoma. I, I, my first sale was... $50,000 preferred security sale to Mr. Higby, I still remember to this day, in Oklahoma on his local utility. And he sent a check to Philadelphia to buy $50,000 of preferred security. That does not happen today. <laughs> so, And it was interesting that I even got that. But um, it's very different today. It's very, as you note, fee-based. It's all about acquiring assets. It's about... Um, you know, uh, the insurance world is there. I think there's some pricing pressure on the insurance. I think there's a lot of tech-based insurance companies that are coming out there and trying to disrupt the space. They haven't made huge inroads yet, but they're starting to. Pricing is becoming more ubiquitous and almost commoditized in that space. So it's, it's so product is not a selling point at all anymore. It's all about service. Um, so if you don't have a good service scenario, um, you know, insurance is, it doesn't matter. Um, so I like your premise of doing assets under management. 
but it is hard to acquire assets. People have relationships, they have brothers and sisters and this and people, oh, my brother does it and in the business. It's just a very saturated marketplace with financial advisors. So it's hard to gather assets because people are hesitant to move. Um, that's why the big firm is nice because you can get a better lead structure there. Um, going on on your own can be a little tricky. Um, especially if you wanted to really launch up your uh, assets under management. Um, but I get it. I love the idea of working with other independent guys or gals. So if you can formulate something as a group, that's awesome. Love it. Uh, you definitely want, you know, people to help you with some of those aspects that you might not like. Um, and, um, I mean, I don't know what else to do there, but, uh, I think, I think it's, it's a numbers game too. So, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta sell, sell, sell in that business and just sort of almost steal market from other advisors because there's so many out there. Um, so that would be my, my advice. Um, and then another question uh, from Martina Wank, uh, who runs that um, nursing business in Switzerland. This is the last question. So Martina says, uh, how can I manage better? How, how can I manage my time better? Um, so Martina, these are good questions. Um, motivating yourself, managing your time, but um, you know, I think um, I, I, you know, the question is, can you shift some responsibilities to other people? Can you uh, figure out ways to use technology to improve your time? Can you um, maybe look at an hourly billing construct if you don't do that versus maybe some fixed fee if you're having trouble managing hours within that scenario? That'll that'll pull down your your commitments um, possibly. Um, uh, so it, it, it's tough. I'd have to understand uh, more what you're trying to do. You know, time management itself is not our specialty. Um, but we, you know, we recommend that you track things like utility as an example uh, for your staff uh, and other things to see if you can improve the time management aspects. So maybe track your own hours for a month. I mean, nobody wants to track as an owner. You don't want to track your hours too much because you have a lot to do in your business. But maybe track for a month or two, see where your time is spent and then start to to maneuver and, and allocate and time block on your calendar, things like that. I'm, I try to do it. Um, I'm not that good at it yet, but I'm getting there with, uh, with improving my time. I've done a massive push in the last six months to do that. Um, it's important, especially as your business grows. So that's it. I hope this was helpful for today. Um, and Heather, I look forward to talking to you more about this acquisition. So this was quick today, but uh, love love uh, helping people. Send more questions my way, and I'll see you at the beach on our next one. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.